it's Melanie. Welcome to my channel. Today we're doing part two of my library book sale haul. So stay tuned. So as you can see, I have another two huge stacks of books that I got from the library book sale. And these are all of the books that I was able to get for free, which is awesome. See, what they do is they have an educator's day where teachers can get books for free. And then they also have the last day of the sale. They, all of the books are free. They just want to get them out there. So, yeah. <laughs> I got lots of free books. So, I'm going to rotate this camera and we're going to get into this. So, like I said, all of these books were free. If you want to see the ones that I purchased, which was a lot as well, make sure to check out part one of this library book sale haul. So the first two books that we have here are from the Alex Unlimited series. We have the Vosserat Code and True Chemistry, and these are by Dan Jolie. And the Vosserat Code is book one, and True Chemistry is book three. So I will tell you about the Vosserat Code. Alexandra Binno can instantly summon parallel dimension versions of herself, but these duplicates are always super idolized. Smart, fast, touch, and often the most beautiful girls in their world, while Alex herself is a clumsy, frizzy-haired wallflower. So when the government recruits Alex for top secret espionage work, it's always her alternate who gets the action and consequently receives all the credit. Sick of being her own sidekick, will Alex be able to crack the Vosserac code and complete her latest mission? Or is she destined to live in her own shadow? And I thought it sounded really cute. Okay, next up we have Half Blood by Jennifer L. Amentrout. And this is the first book in the Covenant series. And this says, Could you kill the one you love? The Hematoi descend from the unions of gods and mortals. And the children of two Hematoi, purebloods, have godlike powers. Children of Hematoi and mortals? Well, not so much. Half-bloods only have two options. Become trained sentinels who hunt and kill demons, or become servants in the homes of the Pures. 17-year-old Alexandra would rather risk her life fighting than waste it scrubbing toilets, but she may end up slumming it anyway. There are several rules that students at the Covenant must follow. Alex has problems with all of them, especially rule number one. Relationships between Pures and Hass are forbidden. Unfortunately, she's crushing hard on the totally hot pureblood, Aiden, but falling for Aiden isn't her biggest problem. Staying alive long enough to graduate the Covenant and become a Sentinel is. If she fails in her duty, she faces a future worse than death or slavery, being turned into a demon and being hunted by Aiden. And that would kind of suck. <laughs> and again, it sounded really cute. And this is apparently a really big series because when I looked it up, there's like five books plus a couple of novellas. Okay, next up is... Politically Correct Bedtime Stories, Modern Tales for Our Life and Times by James Finn Garner. And I remember Politically Correct Fairy Tales from, gosh, back when I was in high school, people talked about them. And when I saw this, I thought this is probably going to be very similar to that. So let me just read you what it says in here. Once upon a time in the olden days, heavyset middle-aged men would congregate in their elitist clubs, sit in overstuffed leather chairs, smoke air-choking cigars, and pitch story ideas and plots to each other. Problem was, these stories, many of which found their way into the general social consciousness, reflected the way in which these men lived and saw their world. That is, the stories were sexist, discriminatory, unfair, culturally biased, and in general, demeaning to witches, animals, goblins, and fairies everywhere. Finally, after centuries of these abusive tales which have been handed down unknowingly from one male biased generation to the next, James Finn Garner has taken it upon himself, that's right, yet another man, to enlighten and liberate these classic bedtime stories and retell them in a way that is much more in keeping with the society in which we live today. 
Politically correct bedtime stories, then, is the fruit of Garner's labors. We'd like to think that future generations of fairy tale fans will see this as a worthy attempt to develop meaningful literature that is totally free from bias and purged from the influences of a flawed cultural past. And yeah, it has stories like Little Red Riding Hood, The Emperor's New Clothes, The Three Little Pigs, Rumpelstiltskin, The Three Codependent Goats Gruff, Rapunzel, Cinderella, Goldilocks, Snow White, Chicken Little, The Frog Prince, Jack and the Beanstalk, The Pied Piper of Hamelin, and yeah, that's all of them. And it's such a short little book too. It's only 79 pages. So this is something I will probably read in like one very short sitting. But I think these are so much fun. They're usually quite humorous. Okay, next up is Die For Me by Amy Plum. And this is the first book in the Revenants trilogy. And this says... My life had always been blissfully, wonderfully normal, but it only took one moment to change everything. Suddenly, my sister Georgia and I were orphans. We put our lives into storage and moved to Paris to live with my grandparents, and I knew my shattered heart, my shattered life would never feel normal again. Then I met Vincent. Mysterious, sexy, and unnervingly charming Vincent Delacroix appeared out of nowhere and swept me off my feet. Just like that, I was in danger of losing my heart all over again, but I was ready to let it happen. Of course, nothing is ever that easy because Vincent is no normal human. He has a terrifying destiny, one that puts his life at risk every day. He also has enemies, immortal, murderous enemies, who are determined to destroy him and all of his kind. While I'm fighting to piece together the remnants of my life, can I risk putting my heart as well as my life and my family's in jeopardy for a chance at love? And it sounded like something I would really enjoy, so I got that. Okay, next up we have The Widow by Fiona Barton. And this is the first book in the Kate Waters series. And this says, Following the twists and turns of an unimaginable crime, the Widow is an electrifying debut thriller that will take you into the dark spaces that exist between husband and a wife. When the police started asking questions, Jean Taylor turned into a different woman, one who enabled her and her husband to carry on when more bad things began to happen. But that woman's husband died last week, and Jean doesn't have to be her anymore. There's a lot Jean hasn't said over the years about the crime her husband was suspected of committing. She was too busy being the perfect wife, standing by her man while living with the accusing glares and the anonymous harassment. Now there's no reason to stay quiet. There are people who want to hear her story. They want to know what it was like living with that man. She can tell them that there were secrets. There always are in a marriage. The truth, that's all anyone wants. But the one lesson Jean has learned in the last few years is that she can make people believe anything. And it sounded very interesting. And there's like, um, there's a lot of blurbs on the back, but I'll just read one of them by Lisa Gardner, who I do enjoy her stories. And she also writes thriller kind of books. She says, the ultimate psychological thriller, Barton carefully unspools this dark, intimate tale of a terrible crime, a stifling marriage, and the lies spouses tell not just to each other, but to themselves in order to make it through. Okay, next we have Firestorm by Iris Johansson. And this says, Number one New York Times bestselling author Iris Johansson turns up the heat in this explosive new psychological thriller that will have readers turning pages as if they were burning. This time, a gifted arson investigator teams up with a mysterious operative to stop a killer raging completely out of control. For Carrie Murphy, the inferno is never far away. The flames of that long ago night still burn in her nightmares. The heat, the choking smoke, the helplessness. She can never run fast enough. Now, Carrie works as an arson investigator with her evidence-sniffing dog, Sam. Together, they are a great team, but only Carrie knows the real reason that they're so good at what they do. Only Carrie and someone from a past she thought she'd put far behind her. But all of that is about to change in the time it takes to strike a match. 
Suddenly, the flames are back, sweeping through her life, and this time, Carrie may not be able to put them out. And now, from out of the ashes of another tragedy, a stranger appears. Who is Silver? And why does this mysterious man need her help? Even more disturbing, how does he already know so much about her? All Carrie is certain of is that he's come to enlist her in the hunt for a psychopath who has left a trail of gruesome, fiery deaths in his charred wake. A human monster determined to bring his own private vision of hell to earth. But the killer Carrie is supposed to find has already found her, and in his twisted thoughts and burning obsessions, the nightmare of her own past threatens to ignite and destroy her. When tragedy strikes, Carrie's one hope is Silver, a man who seems to have no alliance to anyone and no authority to answer to. A dangerous man who seems to know Carrie's mind almost as well as she does herself. But even together, Carrie and Silver may have met their match in a killer as cold-hearted as his method is red-hot. And to save themselves and the innocents whose lives are at stake, Carrie may have to reach deep into the very past that once already nearly destroyed her to do what she hoped she'd never have to do. Fight fire with fire. Next is another book that I actually got from Marty, and this is Beyond the Stars, Quest for Tomorrow, and it's a novel by William Shatner. And Marty is a big Star Trek fan, so I, when I saw this, I was like, yeah, I have to get that. That's really cool. I think he'll enjoy that. <laughs> okay, next up we have Alone by Lisa Gardner. And this is the first book in the Detective Dee Dee Warren series. And wow, this is another long series. It has at least nine books right now and two novellas. And if you watched part one of my library book sale haul, you would have seen that I hauled a book called Find Her by Lisa Gardner. And I didn't realize that, but that was actually part of a series. It's book eight of this series. So... Looks like I have a lot of books in between to get as well. So this says, From the New York Times best-selling author of The Killing Hour and The Perfect Husband comes a brilliant new novel of seduction, deceit, and revenge that will leave readers breathless and defenseless because the killer who stalks these pages knows just when to strike. It's where you're most vulnerable. It's where there's no one to hear you cry for help. It's the last place you want to be when this killer comes. Alone. Alone. Massachusetts State Trooper Bobby Dodge watches a tense hostage standoff unfold through the scope of his sniper rifle. Just across the street in wealthy Back Bay, Boston, an armed man has barricaded himself with his wife and child. The man's finger tightens on the trigger and Dodge has only a split second to react and forever pay the consequences. Alone. That's where the nightmare began for cool, beautiful, and dangerously sexy Catherine Rose Gannon. 25 years ago, she was buried underground during a month-long nightmare of abduction and abuse. Now, her husband has just been killed. Her father-in-law, the powerful Judge Gannon, blames Catherine for his son's death and for the series of unexplained illnesses that have sent her own young son repeatedly to the hospital. Alone. A madman survives solitary confinement in a maximum security prison where he'd done hard time for the most sadistic of crimes. Now he walks the streets a free man, invisible, anonymous, and filled with an unquenchable rage for vengeance. What brings them together is a moment of violence, but what connects them is a passion far deeper and much more dangerous. For a killer is loose, who's woven such an intricate web of evil that no one is above suspicion, no one is beyond harm, and no one will see death coming until it has them cornered, helpless, and alone. Sounds really good. Okay, next we have Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil by John Berent. And I vaguely remember watching this movie long, long, long time ago, and I really don't remember too much about it, but the only thing I can really remember is that it was a murder case in Savannah, Georgia. So, let me read this. 
Shots rang out in Savannah's grandest mansion in the misty early mornings of May 2nd, 1981. Was it murder or self-defense? For nearly a decade, the shooting and its aftermath reverberated through this hauntingly beautiful city of moss-hung oaks and shaded squares. John Berent's sharply observed, suspenseful, and witty narrative reads like a thoroughly engrossing novel, and yet it is a work of nonfiction. Berent skillfully interweaves a hugely entertaining first-person account of life in this isolated remnant of the Old South with the unpredictable twists and turns of a landmark murder case. It is a spellbinding story peopled by a gallery of remarkable characters, the well-bred society ladies of the Married Women's Card Club, the turbulent young redneck gigolo, the hapless recluse who owns a bottle of poison so powerful it could kill every man, woman, and child in Savannah, the aging and profane Southern Belle, who is the soul of pampered self-absorption, the uproariously funny black drag queen, the acerbic and arrogant antiques dealer, the sweet-talking, piano-playing con artist, young blacks dancing the minuet at the black debutante ball, the Minerva, the voodoo priestess who works her magic in the graveyard at midnight. These and other Savanians act as a Greek chorus with Burnett's revealing the alliances, hostilities, and intrigues that thrive in a town where everyone knows everyone else. Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, a Savannah story, is a sublime and seductive reading experience. Brilliantly conceived and masterfully written, this enormously engaging portrait of a most beguiling southern city is certain to become a modern classic. And something I thought was interesting was this cover actually comes off and there's another cover under it. And it says, The National Phenomenon is now a major motion picture from Warner Brothers, directed by Clint Eastwood. <laughs> okay, next up is a book that I think Xander actually picked up, but I thought would be interesting to read. It's called The Exploding Toilet, Modern Urban Legends, collected and retold by David Holt and Bill Mooney, authors of Spiders in the Hairdo. And this really is just about urban legends that you've heard and kind of maybe debunking them. It says, Hey, did you hear about the guy who dropped a lit cigarette into a toilet without seeing the gasoline rag soaking in the bowl? Of course you did. It happened to your cousin's gym teacher. Or was it your gym teacher's cousin? Storytellers David Holt and Bill Mooney follow up their previous hit, Spiders in the Hairdo, with a whole new collection of modern urban legends here you'll find stupid criminals, government snafus, scary stories, and a section featuring the internet. These stories are too good not to pass on. Once you start telling them, your friends will say you're on a roll. And I thought it'd be interesting to read. And there's also some illustrations. <laughs> okay, next up is The Fairest of Them All by Caroline Turgeon. And this is sort of a Rapunzel and Snow White retelling. And this is, In an enchanted forest, the maiden Rapunzel's beautiful voice captivates a young prince hunting nearby. Overcome, he climbs her long golden hair to her tower, and they spend an afternoon of passion together. But by nightfall, the prince must return to his kingdom and his betrothed. Now king, he weds his intended, and the kingdom rejoices when a daughter named Snow White is born. Beyond the castle walls, Rapunzel waits in her crumbling tower, gathering news of her beloved from those who come to her seeking wisdom. She tries to mend her broken heart, but her love lingers, pulsing in the magic tendrils of her hair. The king, too, is haunted by his memories, but after his queen's mysterious death, he is finally able to follow his heart into the darkness of the forest. But can Rapunzel trade the shadows of the forest for the castle and be the innocent beauty he remembers? And you know I love me a good fairy tale retelling. Okay, next up we have My Tie to Murder by Candy Calvert. And I thought this looked super cute. Apparently this is the third book in the Darcy Cavanaugh mystery series. 
Though I think this is one of those that you can actually read the books on their own. So if I don't find the first two books in the series, I can still read this one. This says, Knives, Poison, Strangulation. ER nurse Darcy Cavanaugh is about to show and tell all kinds of deathly do's and don'ts for a mystery writer's workshop at sea. If only she didn't have to share deck space with her boyfriend's uptight mother. Aspiring novelist and wife to a powerful Virginia judge, Mrs. Schuyler wishes her son had better breeding prospects than a red-headed Yankee from California. To make matters worse, the Schuyler matriarch wants to submit her novel to a merciless agent whose biting criticism is matched only by her squawking, sailor-tongued parrot. In a crazy twist, a real murder takes place and the judge's wife becomes the main suspect. To protect her boyfriend's mother, Darcy scrambles to peg the real killer from a tangled and nutty case of desperate writers, overzealous fans, and distracting male cover models with killer abs. And it sounded really cute. Okay, next up we have Hide by Lisa Gardner. And apparently this is the second book in the Detective Dee Dee Warren series. So I already read you about the first book, so I'm not going to read you about this one. Okay, next up we have The Whisperer by Donato Carsi. And I thought it was really pretty. <laughs> this is the first book in the Mila Vasquez series. And this says, Six severed arms are discovered, arranged in a mysterious circle, and buried in a clearing in the woods. Five of them appear to belong to missing girls between the ages of 8 and 13. The sixth is yet to be identified. Worse still, the girls' bodies, alive or dead, are nowhere to be found. Lead investigator Mila Vasquez, a celebrated profiler, and Goran Gavila, an eerily prescient criminologist, dive into the case. They're confident they've got the right suspect in their sights until they discover no link between him and any of the kidnappings except the first. The evidence in the case of the second missing child points in a vastly different direction, creating more questions than it answers. Vasquez and Gavila begin to wonder if they've been brought in to take the fall in a near-hopeless case. Is it all coincidence, or is a copycat criminal at work? Obsessed with a case that becomes more tangled and intense as they unravel the layers of evil, Gavila and Vasquez find that their lives are increasingly in each other's hands. The Whisperer, as sensational a bestseller in Europe as the Stieg Larsson novels, is that rare creation, a thought-provoking, intelligent thriller that is also utterly put-downable. Okay, next we have Spirit Bound, a Vampire Academy novel by Rochelle oh. Mead. And this is the fifth book in this series. And this is another large series. It looks like there's at least six books in this series. So I'm going to read you about the first one. Pulled it up here on Goodreads. The first one is called Vampire Academy. And it says, Only a true best friend can protect you from your immortal enemies. Liza Dragomir is a moray princess. A mortal vampire with a rare gift for harnessing the Earth's magic. But she must be protected at all times from the Strigoi. The fiercest vampires, the ones who never die, the powerful blend of human and vampire blood that flows through Rose Hathaway, Liza's best friend, makes her a damn fear. Rose is dedicated to a dangerous life of protecting Liza from the Strigoi, who are hell-bent on making Liza one of them. After two years of freedom, Rose and Liza are caught and dragged back to St. Vladimir's Academy, a school for vampire royalty and their guardians-to-be hidden in the deep forests of Montana. But inside the Iron Gates, life is even more fraught with danger and the Strigoi are always close by. Rose and Liza must navigate their dangerous world, confront the temptations of forbidden love, and never once let their guard down, lest the evil undead make Liza one of them forever. Okay, next up we have Above by Leah Bobbitt. And She's got like the fairy wings here. I thought it was really pretty. And this says, Iridescent. I read that word in one of Atticus's thick old books once. When I went to Jack to ask him what it meant, 
He held his hand out, and they glowed so gentle I thought they might kiss the air. And since that day, I wanted a place that was iridescent, that lit without burning. Being in love is sort of like that when it's real, when it's true. It's like that to watch Ariel smile. Matthew has loved Ariel from the moment he found her in the tunnels, her blonde hair shining and her bee's wings falling away. They live together in safe, a refuge deep underground for those fleeing the harsh city above, as does Whisper, who speaks to ghosts, and Atticus, who has thick claws for hands, and Jack Flash, who can shoot lightning from his fingertips. But one terrifying night, an old enemy invades safe with an army of shadows, and only Matthew, Ariel, and a few friends escape above. Forced to survive in the most dangerous place he can imagine, Matthew strives to unravel the mystery of the shadow's power and Safe's own secret history. For he knows he must find a way to remake Safe, not just for himself and his friends, but for Ariel, who's again faced with a life she fled and who needs him more than ever before. A gorgeously imagined urban fantasy and a deeply moving love story Above is the debut of an extraordinary new voice. Okay, next up we have The First Wife by Erica Spindler. And this is another thriller kind of book. It says, A fairy tale love, a terrible past that won't stay buried, a killer who may be hiding in plain sight. As a child, Bailey Brown dreamed of a storybook rescue, of a knight in shining armor swooping in to bring her and her mother to a better life. After her mother died, those dreams transformed, becoming ones of a mysterious stranger who would sweep her off her feet and whisk her away from her ordinary existence to one of passion and adventure. Then, suddenly, there he is, tall, dark, and wonderful. Despite the 10-year difference in their ages and the differences in her working-class upbringing and of his privilege, Logan Abbott and Bailey fall deeply in love. Marriage quickly follows. However, when Logan brings her home to his horse farm in Louisiana, a magnificent estate of 90 wooded acres, her dreams of happily ever after begin to unravel. A tragic family history she knew nothing about surfaces, Plus, there are whisperings about the disappearance of his first wife, True, and then rumors about the other women from the area who've gone missing. And when another woman disappears, all signs point to her husband's involvement. At first, Bailey ignores the gossip, even as it grows louder and the circumstantial evidence against Logan mounts. But finally, she must make a choice. Believe what everyone says is true and turn against the only person who ever saved her, or bet her life on the man she loves, but who she realizes she hardly knows. Okay, so that's the first big stack. Let me move these out of the way so I can get to the other big stack behind it. And here is the other big stack of books. Okay, so the first book here is A Reliable Wife by Robert Gulrich. And this says... He placed a notice in a Chicago paper, an advertisement for a reliable wife. She responded, saying that she was a simple, honest woman. She was, of course, anything but honest. And the only simple thing about her was her single-minded determination to marry this man and then kill him, slowly and carefully, leaving herself a wealthy widow. What Catherine Land did not realize was that the enigmatic and lonely Ralph Truitt had a plan of his own. Okay, next up is Sweet Unrest by Lisa Maxwell. And this is the first book in the Sweet Unrest series. And this says, New Orleans, a world where souls walk free and dreams become powerful portals to the past. For as long as she can remember, Lucy Ames has been plagued by a dark, reoccurring dream of drowning. But when her family moves to an old plantation outside New Orleans, she starts having intense new dreams, vivid scenes of a bygone era filled with people she shouldn't know, but does. Searching for answers to her haunting visions, Lucy reluctantly descends into the city's mystical culture. What she finds is Alex, a charming but mysterious boy who behaves as if they've known each other forever. Lucy shouldn't be so drawn to him, 
but she is. As she tries to solve the mystery surrounding Alex, a centuries-old vendetta unspools around her, resulting in a vicious murder. Now trapped in a dangerous crossfire, Lucy must act fast to save her future and everyone she loves. And I thought that sounded really interesting. Okay, so here, as you can see, they're very dark. This is a collection of some classics. This is the International Adventure Library. So this one is Dracula. And I don't know how old these are. This says copyright 1897. And this one is... Clique of Scotland Yard, Detective Stories by T.P. Hanshaw. And then this one is The Hollow Needle, an adventure story by Maurice LeBlanc. And there's like a, a mess up in the print here, but it looks like 1912 maybe. And this is actually written in here in the front and it says, Mr. L.E. Janey, Pax, West Virginia. March 22nd, 1922. These are some old books. Next we have The White Waterfall. This is also written in January 16, 22. And the copyright on this is 1912. Then we have Tales of Sherlock Holmes by Sir Conan Doyle. I would have to guess that this is around the same time as the others. But it looks like it's missing, possibly missing the page that has the copyright stuff on it. This one is The Devil's Admiral by Frederick Ferdinand Moore. This is an adventure story. And this is copyright 1913. And then The Crystal Stopper. This is also written in here, January 1622. The Crystal Stopper is also by Maurice LeBlanc. And it's another adventure story. And copyright 1913. That is really cool. Okay, next we have Thriller. Stories to keep you up all night. Edited by James Patterson. And it looks like there's a lot of authors for this book. It says, be prepared to be thrilled as you've never been before. Featuring North America's foremost thriller authors... Thriller is the first collection of pure thriller stories ever published, offering up heart-pumping tales of suspense in all its guises are 32 of the most critically acclaimed and award-winning names in the business. From the signature characters that made such authors as David Morrell and John Lescroar famous to four of the hottest new voices in the genre, this blockbuster will tantalize and terrify. Lock the doors, draw the shades, Pull up the covers and be prepared for Thriller to keep you up all night. So the names of the authors are listed here. It says Ted Bell, Steve Barry, Grant Blackwood, Lee Child, Lincoln Child, David Dunn, Heather Graham, James Griffinato, Denise Hamilton, Raylan Hillhouse, Greg Hurwitz, Alex Cava, J.A. Conrath, John Lescroart, Robert Leparulo, David Liss, Eric Van Lesbader, Dennis Lenz, Gail Lenz, Chris Mooney, David Morrell, Catherine Neville, Michael Palmer, Douglas Preston, Christopher Reich, Christopher Rice, James Collins, M.J. Rose, James Siegel, Brad Thor, M. Diane Vock, and F. Paul Wilson. That sounds like fun. Next we have, oh, this is a heavy book. Lovers and Liars by Sally Bowman. And this is a seriously heavy book. How many pages are in this? 582 pages, but dang, it's got some weight. This says... Now from the author of Destiny comes a novel certain to be talked about, as richly romantic and wicked as that number one New York Times bestseller. Lovers and Liars is Sally Bowman's sensuous, very contemporary story of public masks and secret lives, of a perfect marriage that is not what it seems, 
and of lovers long separated yet destined to meet tumultuously again. On a frosty January morning, soon after the New Year's revels, an exquisitely dressed, beautiful blonde woman sends four identical parcels to four different destinations. Paris, New York, Venice, and London. But the lovely messenger is not who she claims to be. Photographer Pascal Lamartine receives his package in Paris. It is a woman's black glove, silky, scented, and disturbing. In London, reporter Jenny Hunter, daughter of a famous Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist, opens her parcel to find even more threatening contents. And within hours, Jeannie's enterprising editor assigns both her and Pascal to expose the story of a lifetime, a story so rich, so ripe with potential scandal, that it could make headlines and ruin lives. For Jeannie and Pascal must penetrate the perfect facade of John Hawthorne, the charming, charismatic U.S. ambassador to Great Britain, to sift through the layers of ever-shifting truth about his life. The wealthy scion of a famous American family, in short, perfect presidential material, John Hawthorne appears to have thrown away a promising political career to take a diplomatic post. Why? His wife, Liz, a legendary beauty, is a master at seducting the media. Her delicate features are a constant presence on the society pages for her charity work, her skills as a hostess, and her unrelenting chic. Yet the exhaustive adoring coverage has left the real woman mysteriously opaque, and now, unbelievably, she seems to be the source of certain whisperings about her husband. But beyond the sensual story they are about to unmask, a black widow web of deceit, betrayal, and dark secrets more complex and perilous than they could have imagined. Jeannie and Pascal must confront themselves, their past, and their brief passionate love affair 12 years before, when the fascination between them reached a fever pitch only to end explosively. Even as their investigation plunged them dangerously into the hypocrisies of the privileged and powerful, where every surprising revelation is replaced by a new, even more shocking contradiction. Past merges with present, taking the two lovers back to the hot, bare room at the edge of danger where for one burning moment, the world made perfect sense, took perfect shape. Deftly woven of erotic secrets and unfolding deceptions that stretch across more than two decades, Lovers and Liars is a romantic and spellbinding, suspenseful journey into the mysteries of the heart where love can sustain the soul or twist it cruelly very interesting sorry if there is an angle change but again my battery died <laughs> okay so next up we have the it girl by cecily von zygasar who is the author of the gossip girl books and this is sort of a spin-off of Gossip Girl, because if you've watched the series or you read the books, there's a character called Jenny Humphreys, and that is Dan's little sister. And when she goes off and leaves the main cast of Gossip Girl, that's where this picks up. So this is book one in the It Girl series, and there's like ten of these books. And this says, popular Gossip Girl character Jenny Humphrey is leaving Constance Billard to attend Waverly Academy, an elite boarding school in New York horse country where glamorous rich kids don't let the rules get in the way of an excellent time. Determined to leave her Manhattan past behind her, Jenny sets off to Waverly with big plans of reinventing herself. She'll be a goddess. She's a sophisticated city girl after all and will find a boy who can properly worship her. But that's going to be a little tricky since her self-absorbed new roommates, Callie Vernon and Brett Messerschmidt, aren't exactly there to help, unless there's something in it for them. Hot guys, new intrigue, and delicious gossip add up to more trouble than ever for Jenny. But even if getting caught with boys and going up against the disciplinary committee is what it takes, Jenny's ready. She'll do all that and more to become the It Girl. I think I'm going to enjoy this series. And if it's not a TV show, I would love for it to be a TV show. Because <laughs> I loved Gossip Girl. 
Okay, next up we have Hunger by Jackie Morse Kessler. And this is the first book in the Writers of the Apocalypse series. And this says, Elizabeth Lewis has a black steed, a set of scales, and a new job. She's been appointed famine. How will an anorexic 17-year-old girl from the suburbs fare as one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse? Traveling the world on her steed gives Lisa freedom from her troubles at home, her constant battle with hunger, and the struggle to hide it from the people who care about her. But being famine forces her to go places where hunger is a painful part of everyday life and to face the horrifying effects of her awesome new power. Can Lisa find a way to harness that power and the courage to fight her own inner demons? And one of the blurbs says, Jackie Morse Kessler hits it out of the park with hunger. Although this is a book with anorexia at its heart, there are no hidden lectures or story slowing aside. Instead, Kessler deftly weaves the heroine, Lisa's struggle with food, into a beautifully realized mythology, complete with a wisecracking and sexy death and a new spin on the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. An absolute must read. And that was Julie Kinner, author of Good Ghouls Do. And I thought it sounded interesting. And it's only like 177 pages. Okay, so the next book we have here is Shut Down, a glitch novel by Heather Anastasio. And this is the third book in the glitch series. So I pulled up on Goodreads what it says about the first book, which is called Glitch. And it says, In the community, there is no pain or war. Implanted computer chips have wiped humanity clean of destructive emotions, and thoughts are replaced by a feed from the Link network. When Zoe starts to malfunction, or glitch, she suddenly begins having her own thoughts, feelings, and identity. Any anomalies must be immediately reported and repaired, but Zoe has a secret so dark it will mean certain deactivation if she is caught. Her glitches have given her uncontrollable telekinetic powers. As Zoe struggles to control her abilities and stay hidden, she meets other glitchers, including Max, who can disguise his appearance, and Adrian, who has visions of the future. Both boys introduce Zoe to feelings that are entirely new. Together, this growing band of glitchers must find a way to free themselves from the controlling hands of the community before they're caught and deactivated, or worse. In this action-packed debut, Glitch begins an exciting new young adult trilogy. And apparently, this one is the conclusion to that trilogy. <laughs> okay, next we have Into the Still Blue by Veronica Rossi. And this is the third book in the Under the Never Sky trilogy. So, the first book is called Under the Never Sky. And I pulled it up here on Goodreads, and it says, Worlds kept them apart. Destiny brought them together. Arya has lived her whole life in the protected dome of Reverie, her entire world confined to its spaces. She's never thought to dream of what lies beyond its doors. So when her mother goes missing, Arya knows her chances of surviving in the outer wasteland long enough to find her are slim. Then Arya meets an outsider named Perry, He's searching for someone, too. He's also wild, a savage, but might be her best hope at staying alive. If they can survive, they are each other's best hope for finding answers. And this actually reminds me a lot of the Pure trilogy that I really, really, really love that. Okay, then the last book I have here is... Shadow Fever by Karen Marie Moaning. And, oh, look at that. Isn't that pretty? It says, when I came to Dublin, honey, my sister's murderer, I found monsters around every corner. But of all the things that go bump in the night, I've begun to wonder if I'm the worst. And this is actually the fifth book in the Fever series. And... I went to pull it up on Goodreads, and there's sort of a synopsis of the whole series. Apparently, there are 11 books in this series, so. 
This says it takes place in the same world as the Highlander series. Includes the Dan O'Malley trilogy. Michaela Lane's life is good. She has great friends, a decent job, and a car that breaks down only every other week or so. In other words, she's your perfectly ordinary 21st century woman. Or so she thinks. Until something extraordinary happens. When her sister is murdered, leaving a single clue to her death, a cryptic message on Mac's cell phone, Mac's journey to Ireland in search for answers, the quest to find her sister's killer draws her into a shadowy realm where nothing is as it seems, where good and evil wear the same treacherously seductive mask. She is soon faced with an even greater challenge, staying alive long enough to learn how to handle a power she had no idea she possessed, a gift that allows her to see beyond the world of man into the dangerous realm of the Fae. I have read some of this series, but it's been a long, long time. I think I read it on my Kindle years ago. So I would actually like to go back and reread that and collect the whole series. Okay, so that is the last of that stack as well. Have you read any of these books? Did you like them? Did you not? Comment down below and let me know. And I have to say, I'm super happy with what I got because, well, they were all free. <laughs> so, yay. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, give me a big thumbs up. If you'd like to see more videos like this, click that subscribe button down below. And until next time, 